everyone. I'm your host, Brittany Jones Cooper, and welcome to Build. Jacob Tobia is a gender nonconforming writer, producer, and performer whose new book, Sissy, takes readers on a gender odyssey they will not soon forget. Tobia writes with honesty, humor, and vulnerability, sharing their personal journey while challenging the long held notion that people are easily sortable into men and women. Please help me welcome Jacob Tobia. Hi. I'm so happy to be here with you. I'm so happy to be sitting across from you. First of all, how do you feel the book is out? I know it's like a labor of love. It was, it's like looking at your book, um, I feel like it, it, it's like getting married. You know, all my friends from growing up are getting married right now. Yeah. And I feel like I have a sense of understanding like how excited they must be about this whole thing, putting a book into the world. Oh. I'm proud of you because I try to write and it just never goes well. So when you see a finished copy, I'm like, yes. Yeah, well, that's why you have a good editor, too. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Because, I mean, like, when I'm writing originally, it's, you know, you have, to, you have to give yourself a safe space and a space to, like, make mistakes and a space to just, like, channel all of the feelings. Um, and, then, and then you refine them and figure out how to shape them and all that good stuff. And if you can't find a way, you just add a little footnote like you have just to, <laughs> to give even more insight into your brain. You guys have to check out, like, throughout the book, there's just, like, little uh, asides from him that are so funny. Yeah, my favorite... Um, my favorite footnote is because there was a moment where we were like, should I define what cisgender means in the book? Um, and I just had this moment where I was like, I, I can't I can't do that work. Like, that's too trans 101. Like, yeah. we're trying to get beyond that. We're trying right. to focus on the experience and the story of this thing. I don't want this to feel like some technical education or whatever. Right. Um, and and so I was like, OK, well, I can't define I can't define cisgender. I won't I won't let myself. But I can put in a sassy footnote that kind of gives the context. And I'm <laughs> Southern, too. I grew up in North Carolina. So it's like the first time I use cisgender in the book. It's like cisgender footnote. And the footnote says, if you don't know what cisgender means by now, it's probably because you are cisgender. <laughs> Bless your heart. Bless your heart. Um, and that's probably my favorite footnote I'll ever write. Yes. Yeah. So let's get into the <laughs> book because it is an education. I think it will be an education for a lot of people, mm. but it really is your personal story, your journey. And one of the things you point out, out early on is that uh, the trans experience has just been so oversimplified. What do you mean by that? Well, I think it's something that happens with many different communities that are marginalized when you're trying to get rights, when you're trying to get respect, when you're trying to get access um, to, to the policies and resources that you need. People feel like, OK, what you have to do is come up with kind of the archetypical narrative, the easy to digest thing, the thing that kind of sands off all the rough edges of your community, um, distills down all the complexity into one little formula. Um, and, and that's the only thing that middle America or the average voter can digest, you know? And I, a, both as an artist and as a political thinker, I refuse to do that because A, when you underestimate people and assume that all they can digest is something uncomplicated, um, then that's, that's how what people get used to, you know? I think if we told more complicated stories more often, people would be able to handle complication more. And if we had more nuance in our culture more generally, people would be better at listening to nuance. Um, but, you know, it's also about, like, as an artist, that's not, that's not how life is. Life is not a convenient narrative. Life is messy as hell, and I am certainly messy as hell. You know, the idea that if you're, gonna, if you're gonna be trans and write a book, you should be an ethically and morally consistent person. And I'm like, well, good luck to anyone I know. I mean, shit, like, I'm de that's definitely not me. Um, and, and I wanted to write a book that felt honest. And to me, writing a book that feels honest means writing a book that embraces the mess and doesn't sand off any of the rough edges. And I didn't even really realize it until you put it in that context of the Mad Libs, that we sort of <laughs> expect people to come forward and put their story in these little boxes so that it's comfortable for us, right. where that may be putting them in a position where they're sharing a trauma before they're ready or anything like that. You know, we put these, this pressure on people. Yeah. And that's, that's the other thing that felt really important to me to kind of resist in this project is that when you're a person of any difference and you're telling a story about what it's been like to navigate the world in your body and your gender and in, in any aspect of who you are, um, there's there's this pressure that like okay so you got to give them the trauma right. you know you got to give them all the most difficult things that you've experienced and not only do you have to have those in order to have your identity respected right that like your difference can't matter if it wasn't hard fought right. but also you have to be willing to share that mm -hmm. and the reality is like sharing sharing things that have hurt you deeply is in public is really hard mm -hmm. it's super vulnerable and people should not be pressured into validating who they are, but with some sort of receipt. You know what I mean? And I think it's really, I think it's really messed up. Yeah. Um, I was about to say a different word. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to oh, say Oh, you it. can say whatever you want. It's here. really fucked up, yeah, it's fucked um, up that guys. we require people to like, you know, well, your transness can't be that important unless you have some really awful story about being trans. And I'm like, 
yeah, fuck that. I don't have time for that. <laughs> like, that's a, that's, that's a rubric under which trans people will never win. It's a rubric under which no storyteller of difference will ever win. And it's on us to be like, hi, I'm here, and that's, like, such a cute idea, but I'm transcending it. Right. I don't have time for it. And that's what I love about the book, Fresh. Your tone is humorous, and you're like, we can laugh about gender. It's okay. It doesn't have to always be this serious, heavy thing. And right. in that, you can share your personal stories and your experiences. Some of them are painful, but some of them are really learning moments, and some of them are light and fun. Um, I want to go back to the beginning with you. Uh, your Halloween story um, really made me rethink the way that we approach Halloween costumes and the gender policing that happens with a six-year-old who just wants a costume. Yeah. So why was it important for you to share that story to show kind of how early on you were sort of being forced into boxes you didn't feel comfortable in? Yeah, well, it was important for two reasons for me to share the, Hall the Halloween story. Because A, when I asked to go as a girl for Halloween the first time, um, it was... It was the first time that I, it was sort of my big, bold, daring experiment as like a six or seven year old, you know, where I said, I know I've already learned from everybody that boys aren't allowed to wear dresses, that I'm not supposed to want to wear a dress, that I have to be a boy, but I'm going to try something different, you know? And it was, it was such a, a precious moment of experimentation, but also a really radical moment of resistance for a child to say, no, I'm going to ask. Right. I'm not even supposed to ask. I'm supposed to, to, to you know, conclude that this is an impossibility, but I'm still going to ask. And I think that moment of power is something that children across, across the world have, where they say, wait, I'm not sure if my gender needs to be what I was taught it was. And I want us, in those moments, to always encourage and honor and celebrate our children. Um, when they say, I'm not, I, I want to try something different, we should always say, yes, I'm, I will support you to the ends of the earth. That's so exciting, and you're going to look adorable. But the other thing, and the other reason I wanted to tell that story, is because on, on, the, on the flip side, I have a profound empathy for what my mom was going through when I asked her that. My mom is here in the audience with us today. Um, she's everything. Uh, she is like trans ally hero number one. Um, and she's been, on, she's been on like the whole press junket with me. And I really have a lot of empathy, and we've worked through this together, my mom and I. Like it's, it's, been, you know, it's been a long process and a long journey, um, one that has ended very beautifully. But uh, you know, we really worked through what it means to empathize with each other. And I have a great, great empathy for any parent who's raising a gender nonconforming child or a trans child in the world that we live in. Um, because we don't live in a world that makes that easy. Um, we live in a world where to have a trans child is to be constantly scared for your child, to never feel like your child is going to be respected in this world, to feel like your child is not going to have an easy life. Um, and so I get that in not wanting me to dress as a girl for Halloween, my mom is having to choose between protecting me and affirming me. And I want to live in a world where no parent has to make that decision ever again. Right. And you make a point that even if um, you are not a trans child, you may just be a child who wants to have some fun and explore. And right. that shouldn't, why, why is that a bad thing? We all kind of have our own personal journeys with our gender yeah. and within our gender. I'm a firm believer that every single person on this planet should wear a pair of high heels just once. Sure. Not, and not as a joke, as a serious, like I'm going to do this for a whole day and see how it feels and see how I feel about it and learn something about myself. Right. You know, and I'm also a believer that like, you know, every person on this planet should like at least try out like a bow tie and a proper tux just just once, you know, because like worst case scenario, like, I mean, I, ju I just think that that the more sort of Janelle Monet energy we bring into the, the universe with tuxedos on everybody, um, the better we will all be. Can we just all be Janelle Monet? Can like, we all just, uh, yeah, like, let's all be just, yeah, that would be great. I'm okay with that. She's like the it. fashion icon of an entire century. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. like, w I've never had, like, a tailored suit, but seeing her in one, I wanted one. Right. Because I'm like, when done right, it looks really fierce. And the story about her suits is so powerful because it's about honoring her parents. Yes. You know, it's about honoring that they that they had to wear uniforms to clean mm -hmm. spaces, and, like, I, I believe that's how it went. Um, and it's about it's about honoring her, her, her parents and her family and her legacy, and that's kind of how it started. And I, I relate so much of that because my, you know, so much of my gender is inspired by my grandmother. Yes. Um, as inspired by kind of her, like, her sort of, like, late 80s, early 90s, pastel, windbreakers, big chunky clip-ons kind of look, but with a little southern twist and, like, some big pearls to boot. That was one of my favorite <laughs> stories in the book when you talk about getting to spend, like, the solo time with your grandma, and at the end of it, she taught you how to skip and blow bubbles and read somebody if you needed to. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that sounds like a really amazing grandma. <laughs> yeah, well, she didn't teach me how to read somebody. Oh, no, you, she yeah. taught me the Lord's Prayer, yeah. um, but I figured out that I could be, like, you know, I could, after I that time with my grandma, I was like, 
like, cool, now I can skip up to someone on the playground, you know, and, and like, like skip up to them, blow a bubble in their face, and be like, you know, Sally, the Lord forgives us as we forgive others. The Lord forgives our trespasses as we forgive others, blah, 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 anyway. But like, I was, yeah, it was, it was a whole moment. I really left out loud at that moment. Yeah. I was like, you use those Bible verses mm. where you can, when you can. My grandma was the best. Both of my grandparents were the best. I, I had really that. good grandparents. That was really sweet. Your, your dedication in the beginning of the book was mm. really sweet to her too. I love that. Um, this is an insanely personal book. Were there um, any moments or any stories that you just decided, I can't put that in, or I'm not ready to, or what was sort of your line on what to share? Mm. Well, it's less about what I'm willing to share because I'm willing to share everything. I don't, it, you know, some people process their challenges in life. Some people process their trauma. Some people process their difficulties. Like they need a cocoon in which to process that. And for me, I only process it in the emerging. You know, like I need to p put all that stuff publicly. I need to write about it to synthesize it and figure everything out. Right, the writing of this book is the healing for me. Right, it was the healing. Like this, it, this literally is a document of it's a documentation of my healing process, um, because that that's the way I know how to heal. Um, so there's not anything really that I would be ashamed to write about or that I would want to withhold from folks. But there's certainly stuff. I mean, like if I wrote everything I wanted to. I mean, A, like, I'm gonna write books for the rest of my life, so get ready. And B, like, it would have been like 1,300 pages. And I'd been like, hi, I'm Jacob. I have a debut book coming out. It's a funny book, and it's 1,300 pages. You can, you can, if you drop it on someone from more than two stories up, they will get a concussion. Like, you know, I, I was like, no, I can't do that. You're welcome. Right, so there was stuff that I had to kind of like, you know, limit or, or say, you know, we'll save that for later. And a lot of that was my history um, and, 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 you know, kind of work as an activist kid. Because I was also an activist kid. As much as as much as I was figuring out my gender, I was like, I was I was fighting. Like I was, you know, at the North Carolina General Assembly lobbying legislators when I was like 16. I was in I was like, you know, in the main park uh, in Raleigh, Moore Square, protesting the Iraq War, like in seventh grade. You know what I mean? Like I was I've always had this kind of activist heart, and that's inspired by my upbringing in the church. That's inspired by my faith tradition. That's inspired by having really really good teachers who like let me read like dystopian novels and think about fascism and how bad it is, like way before probably a lot of kids got the chance to read that stuff. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot I wanna say about that. And then there's also a lot I wanna talk about in terms of, um, in future work about, about kind of what, uh, what sexual liberation looks like in the context of trans identity. Cause that's a conversation that like, you know, right now we're just fighting as trans people for the right to exist. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not enough. Like I, as a trans person want to exist, be loved, make out a lot and like, you know, have like, have like a cute partner and like get laid, you know, pretty frequently. Like that would be a, ideally a, a, a goal of mine. And I think that we need to live in a world where trans people have the same access to partnership and romance and sex and cute dates as anybody else. Else. And, and that's one reason I, one reason I love um, that you tied in religion throughout the book. That's something that's been a part of your life from growing up in North Carolina. And I think so often we separate sexuality and religion. Mm -hmm. And for you, you made a stance that you didn't have to do that. Yeah. For me, my it was funny because I what I was taught in the church. It would just, people would teach me things, and then I guess the expected reaction is that you're supposed to like learn something and then and then from your religious experience, like learn to hate yourself or have self-loathing. And I would just be taught things. They'd be like, so God loves all of us. And I'd be like, cool, including my trans ass. Next. <laughs> like, it would be like, it'd be like, great, done, you know? Like, Jesus loves everybody. I'd be like, cool, me, also. Also me and you and everybody, cool. So queer people need to be in the church and be pastors and have our lives affirmed, because God made us, and like God made us all in, you know, her image. And I was like, okay, cool, so me too. I'm good. You're good. Why aren't you good? Oh, you're not chill. Oh, you don't. Oh, no. Like, you're. Oh, uh oh. You read this very differently. Where, like, where are the exclusion clauses? Like, is there fine print I'm missing in this Bible? Because, like, I don't. You know, I mean, like, I obviously know where the passages are that say things about, like, not being gay or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, sure. They also say don't eat shellfish. So put down that shrimp cocktail, every fundamentalist Christian in the entire country. You know, and don't ever wear mixed fibers in your clothing because that's a sin, too. Like, if you're going to wear mixed fibers, I'm going to have butt sex and it's going to be okay. <laughs> and God still loves me, all right? That's, that's what I'm here to say. You know what I mean? That's not in the book yet, but there are butt sex jokes. My mom laughed at one when I read her the book. She laughed at a butt sex joke, and that was the victory of my entire comedic career. Oh, I love that. My mom would be like, Brittany, 
Uh, that's great. You're a good you boss. You did, though. She really still did. She's, She's laughing. laughing right now. She's still laughing. Yes. I'm um, talking about parents. I, I love how vulnerable you were when you were talking about um, the process of coming out, right? Mm. Because it's not just something that happens. And I think yeah. that's really important to note. And with your dad specifically, you said, my dad is a reasonable, loving person who was completely unprepared to have a child like me. And I thought that was really be beautiful that um, our parents maybe grew up in a different time and that doesn't make them bad people. And that it just takes maybe some time and a process to get them on the same page. Right. I, I don't, I think we really, um, we underestimate just how far empathy can take us when thinking about our relationships with, um, with our family. And it's not easy. And I'm also not saying that anyone should, you know, endure an abusive situation or whatever, but like if your parents are just taking a while to figure it out, like it's okay to give them that time. It's okay to have a few awkward dinners. It's okay to have awkward dinners for like five years. That happened for me, you know what I mean? Because the other thing that happened is like, I, I didn't make it easy on my parents because I was like, okay, I'm gay. And they were like, okay, we're done. And I was like, yeah, I'm done. And then I was like, um, okay, pause. I'm also an activist and I'm gonna write about it in the newspaper, sorry. And they were like, okay, are we done? And I was like, yeah, we're finished. Oh, wait, actually, I think I'm gonna wear lipstick. Okay, are we finished? Yeah, yeah, we're finished. Oh, and maybe dresses too. Okay, now I'm gonna write a book about my. You know, I just I just kept adding things after they thought I was finished. So in some ways, I was being difficult as well. Um, but also, I was just discovering my gender in real time. Um, but all that is just to say that that the patience is is worth it. And I don't think that we, unless if if the idea of telling people in your life who are rejecting you to fuck off gives you power and helps you in that moment, by all means, you go for it, I support you, I'm behind you, I will be your chosen family to help you out on the other side, you know what I mean? But if, if you feel like this instinct of like, I think I wanna stick with this person and help them figure it out, even though that's not like the cool radical thing to do, it's actually just as radical. It is radical to love someone while they figure out how to affirm you in a world that didn't teach them that. And uh, you talk about in college when you're running for the undergraduate trustee. Yes. Um, I really connected to this story because I ran for an office in college. Oh, and not the worst. And my race was a factor. <laughs> Being a black mm -hmm. woman was a factor. Mm -hmm. And so you telling your story, I was like, oh, I'm still mad about it. And I yes. like that you were like, yeah, I'm still pissed because I just want to have this level playing field. And it's not. Right. I mean, so much of what I've learned in my journey with gender, um, you know, it's it's been a really just a, such a blessing because I feel like I'm in solidarity with so many other folks. Yeah. You know, I feel like we're all in solidarity together because there are so many of us out there who we all have that race we lost or that scholarship we didn't get or that school we didn't get into or that job we didn't get. We all have that thing that we know we lost in our gut yeah. because someone was discriminating against us. We don't have proof. We don't have evidence. We couldn't win in a court of law, but we know that they deprived us of an opportunity that we rightfully deserved because of who we are. Your gut knows discrimination more than anything else. Your brain can't even figure it out sometimes, but your gut's like, no, fuck that person. That person discriminated against me. And you feel it in the most subtle of details. You know what I mean? You feel it in like the way someone looks at you, just teeny bit off. Or like that little pause in the conversation where they're trying to figure out what to even do with you. Um, and, I, and I think it's so important for us as people of difference in any capacity to be like, yeah, I lost that shit. I deserved that shit. And I never have to get over it. I'm going to keep yelling about it until I get what I deserve. You know, because we all should get what we should all get what we deserve in the good sense of that phrase. And you keep yelling about it because it's something that we see in our local politics, our right. county politics, our national politics come around election time. And it's like we need to make sure that we're supporting certain candidates because of what it does for the bigger conversation. Right. And it's beyond us, really. It's just like putting the people in positions of power to make change for all of us. Yeah. So I, really I, I think the congressional that. elections of this last cycle yeah. really showed us that like we live in an exciting, like we live in an exciting time and there's some shit happening. Yeah. It's, you know, there's a lot of other shit that's really rough, but like, you know, like, I mean, the, the freshmen in Congress ladies, they give me hope every single day. I look at them and I think, I can, I'm going to get through this. I'm going to get through this because you're there. We're, I'll figure it out too, okay? I won't give up because you didn't. So on that, where do you think we are in terms of having conversations about the gender binary and the trans community? Do you, do you feel like there's been progress in the last five years? Where's the work that still needs to be done? Oh, there's been huge progress. I mean, oh my God. I didn't even know that I counted as part of the trans community until this trans tipping point started to happen. You know, like I read Redefining Realness by Janet Mock. Do y'all know Janet Mock? 
she's everything. Um, she's like she's like my my icon and my role model, and and has been a friend to me too. Which is like I just pinch myself every time. Praise for the book, didn't? Yes, she, she did. Yeah, which is yes. so amazing. Um, and you know, like I read her book, and it was a whole memoir about her coming into her identity as a trans woman of color. And I read it, and I was like, a, oh my god, this is my community for real. And b, like. I, I want to do that too. So I just think that, that the way we've been able to tell our stories has been incredible, but I don't want us to make the mistake of assuming that visibility is the end goal, right? Visibility is the very, very, very beginning of any movement, right? Getting a few trans characters in television and a few queer and trans books published, you know, over, over you know, three decades is the beginning of a movement that's going to take a century, right? Like, we are going to be transforming gender. I'm going to be transforming gender with all y'all. We're going to be working together to heal our shit and transform this shit for the next hundred years. Like, let's go. It's a long haul, and I can't wait. On that, let's go to the audience for some awesome. questions. Awesome. What do we have first? What's going on, Jacob? Hi. Congrats on the book. So my sister's a first grade teacher here in the city, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's come to my attention that kids are making decisions at a younger age. But I feel like a lot of pressure is put on the parents. Mm. So what advice do you have for the parents that are dealing with children that are making decisions at this young age? Mm. Um, well, first off, I am not a parent, so I'm not going to say that I am an expert on parenting, and I'm not going to say, like, that I, I'm not going to sit around and be like, I can tell you what to do with your children, because I, I can't fully understand that yet. I'm about to be an auntie, mm -hmm. um, because my brother's having a kid, so I'm going to be able to, you know, understand <laughs> some of that, but, um, I, I would say that the thing that's most important, and what would have mattered to me, um, is that kids know their gender, even if they're experimenting, they know what experiments they need to do. There's a gut thing that motivates it, you know? And if you have a child who is trying to explore their gender in any way, it, they're not making it up. Even if it's not their permanent place, even if they just want to try out a sparkly tutu for a day, and then they're like, yeah, I didn't, I mean, it was okay, yeah. you know? Like, I think that they know what they need. Um, and I would hope that parents would find a way to affirm what their kids are trying to do. Uh, and would, would find a way to just say, yeah, sweetie, I back you up. And I'm going to help make your life easier within my power um, and, and as much as I can. But I also don't want to act as if that's going to be easy. That's really hard as a road for a parent. To affirm your trans child is really difficult. Um, yeah. Um, there's a book uh, Jody Patterson wrote. Um, she has a trans son. Mm -hmm. And it's a really beautiful story. It's called A Bold World. And it's about her journey as a parent. Um, her son, I think, was three Mm -hmm. when he made the decision and she had to learn how to be okay with that. And it's just like a really bold tale and something that maybe you should have your sister check out because it is a whole different perspective. Yeah, but I think your kids can lead you when it comes to their gender. Yeah. Um, and then you can help your kids understand and support them um, through whatever the world throws at them for that. Well, Jacob, I really enjoyed uh, this book. I think it's so important and it's so fun. Like you said, this shouldn't totally be like a downer conversation. I right. think we're celebrating a beautiful life and a beautiful journey. And to quote you, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And thank you for writing this book. Guys, give it up for Jacob Tobia. Thank you for having me, Brittany.